In our final chapter this semester, we'll be examining the endocrine system. We'll look at the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, as well as several other prominent endocrine glands. We'll discuss some of the hormones and their various actions. We'll look at stress and the adaptation to stress, as well as some more local signaling that we see with dicosinoids and paracrines. And finally, we'll consider some endocrine disorders. Internal communication is necessary for the coordination of all the cell activities in our body. There are four principal mechanisms of communication between the different cells. First of all, there are gap junctions. Gap junctions we've explored already. They're pores in the cell membrane that allow signaling molecules and nutrients and electrolytes to move from one cell to the other, literally directly through the cytoplasm between cells. Neurotransmitters We've explored in our chapters on neurobiology, they're released from neurons and travel across the synaptic cleft to a second cell. Then there are paracrine, or local hormones. These hormones are secreted into the tissue fluids and affect nearby cells, so they don't even go into the circulation. And then hormones. Hormones are chemical messengers. They travel in the bloodstream to other tissues and organs at various places throughout the body. The endocrine system is composed of glands, tissues, and cells that secrete hormones. The study of this system and the diagnosis and treatment of disorders of the system is called endocrinology. The organs that are the traditional sources of hormones are the endocrine glands, and the hormones are chemical messengers transported in the bloodstream which stimulate physiological responses in cells of another tissue or organ, often a considerable distance away. So endocrine cells in one region of the body might secrete stuff into a capillary bed, travel through the circulatory system, and then affect cells in a totally different location. This figure on the right shows you the various endocrine glands. We'll go into more detail in these throughout the content of this chapter. We examined the category of glands that we consider exocrine glands earlier in the semester. You'll recall that these have ducts. The ducts carry a secretion to an epithelial surface outside the body or the mucosa of the digestive tract. So essentially these are external secretions, hence the name exocrine. They're secreted outside of the tissues via a duct. The endocrine glands have no ducts, and they secrete things to the inside. They contain dense, fenestrated capillary networks, which allow easy uptake of hormones into the bloodstream. These are internal secretions, as in they're secreted into the bloodstream, internal to us, as opposed to outside of our body or into the gut tube, which is essentially an external surface. So these endocrine glands have intercellular effects, like altering the target cell metabolic rate. The liver cells defy any rigid classification. They release hormones. We'll also learn in the future that they release bile into the ducts that aids in digestion. It also releases albumin and blood clotting factors into the blood. But these are not hormones. So the liver functions as not only an endocrine gland, but in many other functions also. When we compare the nervous and endocrine system, we'll find that they're very tightly related to each other. Sometimes it's even difficult to separate out nervous from endocrine, and they certainly are interdependent on each other. Both serve for internal communication. The nervous system is both electrical and chemical in nature. However, the endocrine system has only chemical communication. The nervous system reacts much more quickly, 1 to 10 milliseconds, and it stops much more quickly. However, because the endocrine system secretes hormones into the blood and they circulate throughout the body, their effect may last from minutes to even days, or could even continue for weeks. When we consider adaptation to long-term stimulus, the nervous system response will decline very quickly. The endocrine system, however, will have a response that persists, so it adapts much more slowly to the long-term stimuli, as we'll see when we explore stress.
The nervous system is targeted to one specific place. A neuron drops its neurotransmitter at a specific location, whereas the endocrine system is general. It has many widespread effects throughout the organ systems. We'll notice that several chemicals function as both hormones and neurotransmitters, like norepinephrine, cholecystokinin, thyrotropin-releasing hormone, dopamine, and antidiuretic hormone. For example, norepinephrine is released by the adrenal glands, as well as some neurons, so it can have an instant effect on, say, heart rate, and even a prolonged effect as it circulates throughout the circulatory system. Some hormones are secreted by neuroendocrine cells. These are essentially neurons that release their secretion directly into the bloodstream. We'll see examples of those as oxytocin from the posterior pituitary, and then catecholamines are secreted in this fashion. Both the nervous system and the endocrine system have overlapping effects on some target cells. As I had introduced with norepinephrine, it's dropped directly on the heart to regulate heart rate, as well as being secreted by the adrenal glands into circulation. This accounts for when we experience the fight or flight, we have an elevated heart rate from the neural interaction. However, even after the stimulus of fear is gone, the Norepinephrine is still circulating in the blood and continues to elevate our heart rate. In addition, we'll see that both norepinephrine and glucagon cause glycogen hydrolysis in the liver. These systems also regulate each other. Neurons will trigger hormone secretion, like we see in the posterior pituitary, and then hormones can also stimulate or inhibit the secretion of neurons. So the systems, as I had mentioned, are very tightly intertwined. Now, as I have mentioned, hormones circulate throughout the blood. Why do they not have an effect on every single cell? Well, the secret lies in the target organs or cells are the organs that have receptors for the hormone, and thus they can respond to it. So going back to norepinephrine again, norepinephrine will have its effect only on the cells that have receptors for norepinephrine. Otherwise, the cells are blind to the passage of norepinephrine and have no response to it.